Okay, I think we can get started now. We've got just about 40 people online, which is nice to see. And it's my great pleasure, as I say, to, to actually introduce you all to this afternoon's seminar series presenters. Our first um, presenter is Megan Topping. And Megan has presented um, previously at our seminars last year where she um, presented her work as scoping review on disability support. This afternoon, Megan's going to talk to us a little bit more about her doctoral work. Megan's a doctoral candidate, an inter international doctoral candidate, who is situated with us at in the Living with Disability Centre, but also in the partnership with Summer Foundation. And this afternoon, Megan is going to talk to us about disability support. And the title of her presentation is, They Treat You Like a Person explaining factors that influence the, the quality of paid disability support. Sorry, I couldn't read my own writing. Okay, over to you, Megan, to start. Thanks, Jacinta. Um, so as Jacinta said, today I'm talking about a part of my doctoral research, um, and it's about exploring the factors that influence the quality of paid disability support. And just to acknowledge Jacinta as my supervisor and also Di Winkler as well. So I'll start by setting the scene and giving some background to my research along with the research aims. I'll then go through an overview of my doctoral research project. I'll speak briefly to my scoping review which as Jacinta mentioned I presented last year so I'll just speak to the findings briefly. I'll then go through my data collection methods followed by some preliminary interview findings and finish with some potential benefits of the research. So my research is focused on support for people, um, adults with acquired neurological disability. And this is a disability acquired after birth and it may be as the result of an acquired brain injury, a spinal cord injury, multiple sclerosis or other neurological disorders. And often people with acquired neurological disability experience a range of cognitive communication and physical impairments, and can therefore have severe and profound core activity limitations. And because of this, require paid disability support in order to live an ordinary life. This support is primarily provided by disability support workers, whose role is to build the capacity of people with disability to make their own lifestyle choices, participate in the community, and achieve their self-described goals. And support workers do this by supporting people with a range of activities, so be that daily living and domestic activities, right up to support with housing, finances and employment. And support workers can be employed under a range of employment arrangements, so they may be employed by a service provider or directly employed by the person with disability. And despite the importance of this role, there's a number of problems in the workforce in that it's often an undertrained and undersupported role. It's often casual, so there's quite high turnover in the workforce. And because of this, there can be variable quality in the workforce as well. So with the introduction of individualised funding schemes like the NDIS, in theory, people with disability have increased choice and control because they have the opportunity to choose and manage supports in line with their needs and preferences. And there's also an increased focus on person-centred approaches to support. However, there's still limited guidance for people with disability navigating these support systems and attempting to build support teams. And there's also arguably increased demands on the disability workforce whose roles are to be responsive to the needs of a widely varying population. So again, there's some room for guidance here for the workforce as to how to deliver quality support. But first of all, we need a better understanding of what quality support looks like. And with that, we can hope to improve the quality of support and also build the capacity of people with disability to choose support workers in line with their needs and preferences. So my research aims to develop a comprehensive theoretical understanding of the factors that influence the quality of support that's grounded on the lived experience of people with acquired neurological disability who receive support, their close others, and also disability support workers. So to answer this research question, my doctoral research started with a scoping review of the existing peer-reviewed literature. 
And the bulk of my study is utilizing in-depth interviews to get the perspective of people with disability, close others and support workers on what influences the quality of support. And then I hope to bring these three perspectives together to develop a more theoretical comprehensive understanding of the quality of support. So to start with the scoping review, um, as I said, I presented this last year. So we completed this in 2020 and both the protocol and the review article are available open access. So I'll just speak briefly now to the uh, findings of the thematic synthesis that came out of this review. Um, but please go ahead and read these papers if you want to know more. So the scope and review revealed six key themes with 18 sub themes pertaining to factors that influence the quality of support. And all of these themes were endorsed by data from the perspective of people with disability, close others and support workers. So the key themes were just here on the left. So choice and control, individualized support, the qualities or personal attributes of support workers as well as the competencies of support workers. And then the relationship between the person with disability and their support worker. And finally, that the person with disability has access to consistent support. So following this analysis, um, I consulted with a person with lived experience of disability who has a wealth of experience receiving disability support. And he reviewed these findings and felt it was an accurate reflection of this support experience for people with disability. But he did feel that there were a couple of factors missing from the review. So firstly, he spoke about when a support worker feels accountable or is held accountable for their work, they're more likely to deliver best practice. And he also talked about the more broader systemic context around support. So how kind of the an example he gave were the rules and regulations of a service provider and how that can sometimes impede the support that is provided. So that was a really quick run through what's quite a lot of information, but overall, this is just to show that it gave us a good foundation. Um, but from, these, uh, from this scope and review, we learned that there were few articles directly investigating what influences the quality of support. So that leads me on to my interview studies. So my interview studies are guided by constructivist grounded theory methodology, which is a qualitative methodology that's best suited to research with limited existing knowledge. And as is the case with most grounded theory studies, we're utilizing one-to-one -one in-depth semi-structured interviews. And we're purposefully sampling um, people who have a wealth of experience with one-to-one -one disability support. And we're also utilizing theoretical sampling, which is a grounded theory sampling technique whereby Participants are sourced to gather more data on particular lines of inquiry as you're analysing the data and when there are any gaps in the data as you go along. So, so far we have interviewed 12 adults with acquired neurological disability, eight support workers and seven close others. Um, but I'm focusing on each of these perspectives independently, um, starting with prioritising the perspective of people with acquired disability. So from here in my presentation, I'll just be talking about my interviews and the findings from the interviews with people with disability. So as I said, the interviews were in depth and they've been conducted via Zoom or over the phone. And this semi-structured interview schedule um, asks questions around experiences of support, both positive and negative, what makes an excellent support worker and what other factors influence the quality of support. And we had planned to do these interviews face to face, um, but due to COVID, we had to move to conducting them remotely. And as this was new territory for us, we um, conducted a rapid narrative review of the literature to inform our transition from face to face to online interviewing. And this review has been published and it also includes a checklist that um, may be helpful if you're conducting online interviews. So this review informed some of the considerations we made when we were um, moving to interviewing online. So we incorporated a distress protocol so that if participants needed any emotional support, we had a plan. Um, we also incorporated some additional strategies to build rapport, given this may be more difficult without that face-to-face -face interaction. And we also gave some options to participate via um, phone or Zoom or in multiple sessions if preferred. Um, so if you want to know more about this paper as well, it's available open access. So moving on to the interview participants, as I said, we've interviewed 12 adults with acquired neurological disability. 
of which four were male, seven female and one is agender, with a mean age of 46. Five had multiple sclerosis, four had had an acquired brain injury, one had had a stroke, one spinal cord injury and one other neurological disorder. Most lived in their own home or a private rental, with three living in shared supported accommodation and one in residential aged care, but all participants received one-to-one -one disability support. And they received this via, um, mostly via a service provider that they had selected. Three um, used support via a service provider their housing had selected, and four employed um, support workers directly themselves. And that adds up to more than 12, you'll notice, um, but that's just because some people had support from both a service provider and direct employment. Uh, the interviews, seven were conducted via Zoom and five over the phone, and they lasted between 30 to 70 minutes with most around the hour mark. Just one participant chose to do the interview in two sessions, and all of the interviews were audio recorded and transcribed verbatim. And all participants' names, so later I'll be giving some quotes and things, and all the names have been replaced by pseudonyms to protect anonymity. So in terms of data analysis, I followed constructivist grounded theory methods, which involve three main coding phases. So you start with an initial coding phase, whereby you label the data and stay really close to the wording used by participants. And then moving to focus coding, which involves considering the frequency and meaning of codes to build categories at a more conceptual level. And then following this, moving to axial coding, which involves considering the relationships between codes and categories. And this isn't a linear process. You go back and forth between coding phases using the constant comparison method, which means you're comparing data within codes and between codes, between and within participants to develop that more conceptual understanding. And it's also important to write throughout analysis. So I utilize grounded theory techniques of memoing, journaling, and using field notes. And we also incorporated a data verification strategy um, whereby I summarized the interviews um, once they were transcribed and sent this back to participants asking for any feedback on just to make sure this was an accurate reflection of what we spoke about and if they had any further thoughts. And this worked really well. Participants engaged really well in this process, um, you know, calling me back, emailing me back, kind of emphasizing points or adding more. So this really embellished the data and was really useful. And I primarily used NVivo software for the data analysis. So data analysis is um, ongoing. So I'll go through the preliminary interview findings now. So the data has revealed a number of factors at the individual level. So thinking about support workers skills and attributes that are important. And then at the interactional level, so interactional between the person with disability and their support worker. So the behaviors in this space and the relational element. And then at the institutional level, which speaks to how the broader systemic context can impact the interactional space and in turn the quality of support. And the factors coming through are really echoing those scoping review themes that I spoke to earlier, with a real emphasis on this interactional space. So at this stage, we primarily have three key interrelated themes that sit in that interactional space, with nine sub-themes pertaining to factors that influence the quality of support. And these three themes are in terms of what the support worker needs to do, so a you need to, what the person with disability wants to have themselves, so that I need to, and how the person with disability and the support worker need to interact and behave together, so we need to. So I'll go through each of these now. So first of all, the support worker needs to recognize me as an individual. The person with disability needs to feel in control. And together, we need to be the right fit. And if we get all of these, we get quality support. So each of these three circles here all have um, sub-themes, which I'll just go through now. So starting with the support worker recognizing me as an individual. So in order to demonstrate this, they need to treat me as a person. So this may look like treating me with respect and dignity, getting to know me and my individual needs rather than seeing me as a disability type and making assumptions. And here Lauren talks about when this doesn't happen. So she says, the words dignity and respect are just something that people don't even think about. 
They just kind of treat me like I'm their job, not a person. And Charlie speaks about noticing a difference from support he used to receive to now. And he says, they didn't know your name, treat you like you're just a body in a bed. Here they treat you like a person. They ask you what you want. It makes you feel a lot better. So you can see how important it is to consider me as an individual and treat me as a person. So consider my individual needs. We then have wanting to support me. So this sits within recognizing me as an individual because in order to want to support me, the support worker needs to recognize me as an individual and understand that the role may look different with me compared to supporting somebody else and really decide that it's me that they want to support. And this theme overlaps with this being the right fit because if we're the right fit, you're more likely to want to support me. And if you want to support me, in turn, we're more likely to be the right fit. And participants emphasize that when support workers are supporting them just as any old job, rather than actually wanting to do it, they don't seem to care about the work and then they don't provide good support. So Kelly here talks about how you can pick up on this. So if people are curt with you, if you can tell they don't want to work with you, that they don't really want to be here, they're just doing it for the money. And Tony talks about him wanting someone who's just interested in helping me. And they can show this by asking a lot of questions. And Charlie talks about the importance of having a happy disposition. You know, be happy to do things to help you. It's horrible to need help at this age. So this theme is also about how you show that you want to be here. So you're positive in your demeanor and you don't make me feel like a burden. And moving on to seeing me as the expert. So this theme involves being willing to learn and listening to me following my instructions and providing support in line with my needs and wants rather than making assumptions and thinking you know best. And this overlaps with feeling in control because if you're seeing me as the expert, I can then lead and this helps me feel in control of not only my supports, but also just my day-to-day -day life. So Lauren talks about wanting her support worker to know that I'm the boss, I want things done my way. It's my life and you're here to help me. And similarly, Alex talks about wanting support workers to just trust what I'm saying. Trust if I say something's important, it is. Trusting, respect my perspective. And Leslie is talking about, which a lot of participants referred to, when support workers who come with perhaps a lot of prior experience come with an attitude that they maybe know best and they can be stuck in their ways sometimes and take over. So, but Leslie says, I don't mind if they have a lot of experience if they come in and are like, okay, this is a different situation. I can adapt, I can apply my knowledge. This is how we do it here, not this is how I do it. Because it's so wrong to come into someone's home and tell them what to do. So it's really that attitude of, how would you like me to support you today? It may be different to yesterday, all of those things. So just assume that I know best about how I want to be supported. And now onto the last of this theme. So support workers need to respond to my needs. So not only do you need to listen to me and understand that my needs may look different, you have to be attentive and look out for my needs and actually have the capacity to respond to my needs. And again, this can help me feel in control because if you're providing the support I need, again, I can feel in control and live my life how I want to. So Kelly, points out the variable nature of her disability. So she says, I've got a variable condition that changes from day to day. So they need to pick up on the job, whether or not I'm strong enough to actually do something or that if I can do something. So it's about not just knowing what my needs are, but knowing that they may change and being able to respond to that. And Lauren similarly is saying she looks for the skill of someone who can handle a body that doesn't necessarily behave the way bodies do. So expecting the unexpected and being able to provide that support. And Isabella captures it really beautiful here where she just says, be helpful when you see that I need some of your support. So look out for what I need and respond to those needs. So within this theme, participants identified some skills and attributes that they desire in support workers that are relevant to each of these sub themes. So, for example, support workers who are empathetic, understanding, respectful, kind, and have a positive attitude are likely to treat me as a person. In terms of wanting to support me, 
It's important to first understand the role. So understand that it's different for each person and understand what it looks like for me in order to know if you want to. And it's also important to have a good work ethic and demonstrate that you're motivated to do the role rather than kind of moan about the role and make me feel like a burden. And finally, that positive, happy disposition that participants referred to that demonstrate that you want to be here. In order to see me as the expert, it helps to be willing to learn and a good listener and be able to follow instructions. There's also an element of being self-aware and reflective and kind of considering whether the support you're providing is in line with what I need. And in the same vein, being responsive to my feedback. And finally, to respond to my needs effectively, it's important to actually be attentive to my needs, be flexible in your practice, be intuitive and a good problem solver because the unexpected may happen. And finally, actually have the capacity to respond to my needs. So here I talk about this knowing the basics. And this is because there are different competencies you might need for different people. So for one person, you may need to um, know how to handle a wheelchair. For another person, you may need to know how to cook. So those kind of basics are different to each person that are required to be able to respond to people's needs. So moving on to the participant wanting to feel in control. So what's really important for feeling in control is having authentic choice. So authentic choice looks like having the opportunity to choose support workers and also having the option to stop working with support workers who are not providing quality support or support in line with your needs. Like Alex captures this really nicely and they say, I think it's better now than it was in the past, referring to their support, because I have more choice about who's here. So if someone isn't giving the quality of support that I want, I have the option of them not working with me. And we've emphasized the importance of the choice being authentic because participants describe times when in theory they had choice, um, but in re reality, this choice was hard to actualize. So, it may be hard to get rid of a support worker because they feared having a worse support worker next. Or as Darren speaks about here, sometimes service providers um, gave a couple of options to approve, but he felt for him really to have the choice, he'd be involved in that interview and he'd um, decide whether those people are good enough to support him or not. It's also important that I can lead my own supports and that helps me feel in control. And this links quite directly with that um, sub theme, seeing me as the expert that I spoke about earlier. So it overlaps with recognizing me as an individual. Because if you're listening to me and following my instructions, I'm able to lead my supports. And this seems also about the person with disability asserting themselves and kind of being in the driving seat. So as Isabella says, I want to be the one calling the shots. It's my life. Why the hell would anyone else call the shots? And Sarah feels that support workers should be taught. The first thing they should be taught is that we're the client, they work for us. And Alex emphasizes how horrible it can be when people are trying to run your life for you. And you're like, excuse me, I'm here. I can run my life perfectly well. So really seeing that, you know, how I want to be supported should be led by me. And now moving to the support worker and the person with disability being the right fit. And for most participants, it was important to be compatible with their support worker. And being compatible looked different for different participants. So for example, Tony in the middle here talks about wanting someone who's happy to be like a mate, enjoys the things that I do, like going to the footy or going to the cricket. So for some participants, it was about similar interests, having things to talk to. Whereas others, it was more of a vibe or about connecting or gelling with support workers. So Sarah says, Never once have I asked to see her resume or her qualifications. And I really don't care what she's got. I care about how we gelled. And for Georgie, using a dating app analogy, says, I don't waste time on the ones, waste time on the ones that I don't, if I don't click with them. If I don't get that vibe, I'm like swipe left. So for some participants, it's just, we just need to get on. We need to vibe, we need to connect in some way. And next we have getting the balance right. So this balance is referring to the kind of tipping scale of it is a work relationship, but it can also get personal. And for some, it's the balance of friendship, but also boundaries. And this theme isn't about saying there's a right balance or a wrong balance. It looks different for each person and each pair. 
which is why I've overlapped it with the sub theme, sorry, the theme of feeling in control, because um, it's about the person with disability leading and whatever the balance is right for them. And this can look different. So Paula talks about um, that support workers become a big part of your life. And with some of them, you can become friends, but it's always good to sort of keep that line there between work and friendship. Whereas Kelly wants the relationship to be more fluid and flexible and have less boundaries, and that's how she prefers it. And Will here is really po pointing out how difficult it can be. He says, it can be really hard when, you know, if I've got one care at four days a week for the next 10 months, it's really hard not to make a relationship out of it. And where do you cross the line, you know? So whilst it can be really hard to get this balance, participants really emphasize how important it is to, when you get that right, it's when it's most comfortable and you get the most productive relationship with your support worker. And finally, we need to work well together. So this is about it being a two-way street. So we need to have mutual respect. We need to listen to one another and be patient with one another. And this overlaps with recognizing me as an individual um, because in order for us to work well together, you need to see me as an individual and respect me, but it's also about it going both ways. So Will here is talking about advice that he would give to a new support worker. And he says, we're both new at this. You're new to me, I'm new to you. Let's be patient and just, if I do anything that you don't like, please let me know and I'd like to do the same. So really emphasizing that we're both in this and it needs to work for both of us. And Paula says, it's an expectation of mine and they understand that and they have respect as I do for them. So that pointing out that reciprocity. And Georgie's talking about, we have so much fun, but there's still respect, but we like, we talk dirty, you know, we're girls. So for Georgie working well together, looks like having fun. So this can look different for different people, but there's always a common thread coming through the transcripts about that mutual respect and communicating effectively. So again, there were some skills and attributes identified by participants that help with being the right fit. So for being compatible, it helps to be open and personable. For some participants, it was important to be compatible in terms of sense of humor and also be easy to talk to. To get the balance right, it helps to be a good and effective communicator. It helps if the person, can, person with disability can trust their support worker. The support worker is respectful, friendly, and it's just good at that relationship management. And finally, in order to work well together, you need, again, to be respectful, patient, an effective communicator, and be willing to compromise. And you may notice that a lot of these skills and attributes are overlapping and coming through a lot, especially that respect and communication, and they'd help probably all of the themes. Um, and it makes sense because all of the themes are kind of leading into one another. But this was just to show that they kind of sit nicely with these key themes of how to build that quality support. So to summarize these preliminary findings, we end up with these three key themes of recognizing me as an individual, feeling in control, and being the right fit. And it seems as though these all sit in that interactional space and directly influence the quality of support. But it's also important to note that there's also this broader contextual factors that can influence whether these key themes in that interactional space are achieved. So in terms of kind of a broader systemic factors, I'm meaning kind of funding arrangements, the availability of support, and this can impact any or all of these three themes in the interactional space. So for example, whether the system allows you to choose your supports can impact whether you feel in control. And then thinking about support arrangements, so whether you get support through a service provider or you directly employ your support, again, can impact all three. Um, but for example, if a service provider is sending me different support workers all the time, we're less likely to be the right fit because we may not have a chance to build that relationship. And lastly, the support environment. So if support's uh, provided in a kind of group home setting, for example, um, participants talked about when they had lived in um, supported accommodation, they felt sometimes they felt more like a number rather than a person and they felt like just a job to get done rather than feeling recognised as an individual. So this is just some examples of how these contextual factors 
they don't necessarily make support better or worse, but they can impact each of these themes in the interactional space. But providing that these three key themes are met, you can get quality support in kind of any of these settings. So to summarize the key learnings so far, we've learned that adults with acquired neurological disability really value feeling recognized, in control, and being the right support, uh, the right fit with their support workers. And those most important factors seem to sit in that interactional space. But there are broader systemic factors that can influence that interactional space. The factors we've identified are consistent with those scope and review findings, and also individualized funding principles such as choice and control and taking a person-centered approach to support. Just want to acknowledge that this isn't the final, final data analysis. Um, and also just to note that we had a limited cultural representation in our sample. And whilst in this project, I haven't had time to explore this question with kind of called communities. I think it's important that future research looks at this because um, meeting language and cultural needs did come up in the scoping review. Um, so it may look different in a different space. And in terms of next steps, um, first of all, finalize this data analysis and then go on to finish my data collection and get the perspective of support workers and close others, and then bring those three perspectives together. And in terms of benefits of the research, we hope to build an in-depth understanding of the factors that influence the quality of paid support that's grounded in the living experience of those who use support and those who are involved and provide support. It's hoped that these theoretical findings can be translated into more practical applications, so thinking about training and development interventions for support workers, as well as practical resources for people with disability and close others who are navigating these support systems. When thinking about future directions, it'd be great to do a co-design project and work with people with disability to turn these theoretical findings into those practical solutions. And these findings could also be the foundations of a measure of the quality of paid support down the track as well. So I just want to wrap up by thanking my research participants for gener generously sharing their experiences and invaluable insights and making this research possible. And thank you for listening. Okay, so I think we're pretty good. I think it's been five minutes. Just see, so yeah, people are here, which is good. So I think we'll move on to this next really scintillating session, I know. And as I said, um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lee Cubis. Lee is a senior research fellow and team manager at the Summer Foundation and we snaffled him from Queensland to get him to come down to Victoria and work with us. And this afternoon, um, Lee is going to talk to us about hospital to home and projects evaluating the discharge planning process for people with acquired disability and complex support needs. So welcome, Lee, it's lovely to have you. And it's all yours. Thank you very much. Um, super exciting to be here today. Um, I'm working today from Wurundjeri land, so I would just like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land here and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, thanks, Megan, for a fantastic um, presentation as well. I always am so enthralled by your work and thought there were some really great question and answers there too, so hopefully I can um, live up to the standard that you've just set. The background to this research on the hospital discharge for people with disability is that this population often faces long delays to discharge and uncertainty about where and how they will live after they've left hospital. And we also know that nearly 60 young Australians with disability enter residential aged care every month in Australia. And that this is a life that's often characterised by boredom, loneliness and um, deterioration in functional capacity and social connections. What we also know is that about 60 or well 59 to 60 percent of younger people are admitted to an acute or rehabilitation hospital before their first admission to residential aged care and this is often after having a brain injury or a late onset degenerative neurological disability such as MS or Huntington's disease. 
um, which means that the hospital discharge process is a place that we can intervene to prevent people from entering residential aged care um, and to ensure that more people are, are discharging hospital and moving into housing with supports that align with their needs and preferences. So the hospital discharge research program that I will be talking to you about today encompasses a scoping review and some mixed method hospital data. Although I must say that I'm only presenting the quantitative component of, of that second project today. So the first thing I will do is talk you through the scoping review. So this was undertaken to to really identify and integrate the findings of any studies that were out there reporting on the experience of hospital discharge for people with disability and complex needs between 2014 and 2021. And this was to highlight key components of an effective hospital discharge for this population. We chose this year range because the disability support sector has evolved so much in recent years that we're really looking at what's kind of going on now in this area. Um, when I say people with disability and complex needs, I'm talking about um, people that, for example, with acquired brain injury, spinal cord injury, perhaps people with a, an intellectual disability who require support on discharge typically or interfacing with um, having to interface with, with health and disability supports and or disability supports um, after their discharge. Um, and we are focusing on people under 65 or 18 to 65 is, is our core age group. In order to complete this scoping review, we compiled a series of search terms and searched four major databases, five major databases actually. Um, and we searched those systematically from 2014 to 2021 for any studies that reported qualitative and or quantitative findings on hospital discharge outcomes for people with disability and complex needs. And key findings from 16 eligible studies were integrated to form overarching principles. What was quite interesting was that we first, we, we did the first search, um, it was early last year, so early 2020. Um, and, and then due to COVID, this project was, was delayed. And so by the time that we'd extracted data from eligible papers, which at that time was from memory seven or eight, um, we had compiled a draft and we were almost ready to, to start to think about submitting it for publication and ran an updated search earlier this year and found almost double the amount of, of eligible papers. So there were um, so many that had been published in that second time frame that, that we had to essentially redo the whole paper. So a lot had been published in recent years in, in sort of the last 12 to 18 months. So the populations that were included in these studies were people with disability, caregivers, there were two studies that had the perspective of caregiver and people with disability, and three studies that included health professionals. Regarding disability type, we had papers, we had studies focusing on people with acquired brain injury, including stroke and traumatic brain injury, people with spinal cord injury, um, and there was one study that had people with acquired brain injury and spinal cord injury, and then one study with various disability types that met criteria as well. The next few slides will focus on the findings of this scoping review. So essentially, once we put together all of the quantitative and qualitative information from these 16 studies, what did it tell us about hospital discharge for people with disability? Um, something to note is that many of these studies weren't actually seeking to evaluate or, or focus on the discharge trajectory as such. Uh, but we were extracting data from papers that included this information anyway. So some of them might have just been a, a, a paper about um, six months post-discharge outcomes for people with stroke. Um, or there might be a paper on improving um, community pathways or in, in improving hospital pathways for people with acquired brain injury. So it wasn't always specifically about hospital discharge. Um, but what we were able to gain was 
was some really interesting and meaningful data about the importance of certain components of the hospital hospitalization and discharge trajectory that influences how people um, experience life after they've left hospital. As this schematic representation depicts, these principles that emerged were very much interrelated, such that, for example, coordination and continuity um, was influenced and, and had similar, I guess, overlap with preparation for discharge. And the third principle, involvement of person with disability and close other, had relevance for both of the other principles. And actually looking at um, Megan's Venn diagram earlier, we could probably present this in a similar way, that there is certainly overlap here. Um, but one, one thing that really stood out as being fundamental across all the papers and, and all of these principles and sort of some components of these principles was the importance of communication. On the next few slides, I've presented each of these broken down into their, their smaller parts and included illustrative quotes from the qualitative material to, I guess, depict the essence of what each of these means. So starting with coordination and continuity, um, this was important within the health system. It was important between sort of hospital wards as well as you know people in this in 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 this situation often will transition from hospital ward to hospital ward, sometimes between hospitals from acute to subacute. Um, perhaps they'll spend some time in general medical, and it was really important for people that they had continuity between those those settings. Um, and this quote, if there was just one person that was dedicated to that family who could coordinate everything, um, that's kind of the essence of what people were looking for there. Much of what emerged in these principles was, was taken from people actually having the opposite of this experience or, or not having good experiences. So some of these quotes are sort of saying what people wish they had, others are saying what they really valued, and others are saying how terrible it was um, when they didn't have that. So within the health system, co coordination and continuity was very important. Um, it was just as important between hospital and community as people were transitioning from hospital to home. And so this quote here, so when you're dealing with state health and the Department of Communities, but within that there's housing and disability services, there's a communication between the three. One can't happen without the other because you can't have sustainable housing unless disability feel that they're going to be able to support this person. Otherwise, they're not going to get housing and vice versa. So there's this sort of tension where if these interfaces between hospital and community aren't well coordinated, somebody can find themselves stuck in hospital for a long time or discharged to housing that does not align with their needs and preferences and may result in um, dangerous discharges and readmissions. And then coordination and continuity amongst post-discharge supports. So one person said, I've been lucky, I've had complete continuity of services of physiotherapists and occupational therapists. I haven't been spread around different people. So the importance of, of the coordination and continuity of post-discharge supports being set up and having people's um, supports communicating with each other as well as, of course, the person with disability and, and their close others. Regarding preparation for discharge, one of the things that was highlighted as, as really important was support workers and, and indeed informal support people, so families, friends, whoever's gonna be providing support to be trained. And so this quote, this person with spinal cord injury has said, having people who know me, know my house, know what I need and can do things is the difference between me waking up in the morning and not feeling like this disability is a big thing. Home visits, which we know home visits are, are often a part of the lead up to hospital discharge, but there was a sense that there were missed opportunities when it came to these home visits. And it was sometimes about there being enough or perhaps not enough scaffolding or learning from them. So this person with ABI, is, who's a, a close other person with ABI has said, um, he had a couple of weekend visits, but that just still somehow wasn't really enough to prepare us. 
So it's not even just about ticking a box that says we've done a home visit, but it's also about is this, um, has it been done enough? Has the, have the learnings been um, integrated and, and really preparing somebody for what life's gonna be like? And preparation for life after discharge. So there was a, an overwhelming sense from people that what they expected would happen and what actually happened were, were two very different things. And this person with acquired brain injury said, I thought it was gonna be a lot easier. I thought I was back to normal, yes, and I was nowhere near. So it's almost this landing with a thud back at home. There wasn't much support, there wasn't much information or data about evaluating adjustment support. In fact, it just seems like it wasn't really on the radar for many of these participants in, in the different studies. Um, but there was definitely a, a sense across the papers of there needing to be more of this. And this close up of a person with spinal cord injury says it well, which is, I just think that, I, I also think that greater support should be provided for us psychologically. Regarding tangible supports, um, housing is something that is very important. Um, we know this and that's one of the basis of, basis of doing this research. Um, and in the papers that were included, there were times where the housing setup wasn't done well and so people ended up back in hospital. Um, some people ended up actually homeless um, or stuck in kind of interim housing. So in a motel, for example, for a really long time, like this person here with a spinal cord injury, who says it's been 14 months now, I guess, so long, just have to be patient. As they say, no place like home, looking forward to going home, you know, do my thing. That's a really long time to be spending in limbo land between being in hospital and, and being in your own home. Home modifications prevented another barrier to people being able to get back home. Um, and when they did get back home, being able to actually access their house. And so this person with stroke has said, I can't get back in my wheel, I can't get back in with my wheelchair. Once I go out, I can't get back up the ramp. So there was a there was a ramp that had been installed at their house, but it actually wasn't very functional. And there were quite a few instances of this throughout the different studies. These two quotations, I guess, depict the differences that in the experiences that people had um, when it comes to whether they were involved or not as active participants. Um, so this first quote from a person, a close other of someone with spinal cord injury says, I felt integrated and fully, a fully participant in the decision-making process. I love the happiness and optimism of healthcare professionals. Contrasted with this person with acquired brain injury who said, I'm quite happy to badger the system um, to feel heard. It just annoys me that I have to do that because I don't think we should have to. And then communication, which was that principle that kind of underpinned and was related to all of the others. Between the people with disability and clinicians, um, so this person with acquired brain injury has reflecting on, on their own communication with their clinicians. Oh, well, they told me that the doctor wouldn't, he'd just ask, how are you going in that? Because he knew that I wouldn't understand or I wouldn't get what he was telling me. I thought, well, if no one's going to tell me, tell me that I'm supposed to be here, I might as well go home. So that sense of um, not a, the, the clinicians not even bothering to talk to this person about what's going on through an assumption that they, that they won't get it or they won't understand. Um, and between close others and clinicians, again, there were a number of, of quotes, but I quite like this one. Um, four weeks after discharge, and we haven't heard a dicky bird from a close other of a person with wide brain injury. Moving on now to the quantitative study. So that's the scoping review. And, and what I'll do at the end of this is sort of talk through um, learnings from these combined projects so far. The hospital data evaluation was designed to evaluate the discharge processes of people with acquired disability and support needs to provide us more information about discharge delays and destinations. And we've been doing this through collecting hospital discharge trajectory data from 10 hospitals in Victoria, New South Wales, South Australia and Queensland. 
And so far we have data for 318 people with um, disability. And um, this has been done through identifying eligible participants and having their relevant data extracted. And we've been collecting data on things like demographics, health and NDIS milestones and discharge outcomes. So to be included in this study, the person with disability had to be aged between 18 and 65, be an inpatient in a subacute setting and be an existing NDIS participant or likely eligible for NDIS. And we've got lots and lots of data that I could share here. Um, I'm going to show trends over time and sort of separated by disability type. And we have enough data to do that. And it's within descriptive data and, and visuals. So you can see from this table that around 70% of the, of the participants are male. Um, primarily people with stroke, acquired brain injury, other neurological conditions and spinal cord injury, although we do have um, representation from people with other types of disability. And it's gone a bit skew if at the bottom there I can see, um, but about three quarters of people in the study were not NDIS participants prior to, prior to their hospitalisation. So that indicates kind of people with a newly acquired disability. The majority of our participants are from Victoria and New South Wales, um, and we're hoping to um, collect more data from around the country as this project goes on and uh, spread from, metro from metropolitan and regional areas um, with very little representation from people from remote areas so far. We've categorised participants in one way is through their year of admission. So, We've got data from people admitted back in from 2015 up until 2021, with most data coming from the latter sort of three to four years. One thing that we've looked at is how long people are in hospital for overall. So looking at this table, there is definitely some variety um, with a trend downwards over the last sort of two to three years. And we can see in the range column that there were some quite extreme um, lengths of stay there. This table here represents length of stay where every dot is a participant or a person who was in this study and the dot is showing how long they were in hospital for. And we can see looking over the years that not only has the median length of stay reduced, but there's significantly less less variation and extreme scores in 2019 and 2020. Whereas, you know, back in 2016 and 2017, we've got people in hospital for years and years. Separated by disability type, um, not a great deal to see here in terms of, you know, when we look at the most recent years, particularly um, similar kind of median and spread of, of discharge of length of stay over uh, people with stroke, ABI, neurological disability and spinal cord injury. And we looked at prevalence of delay to discharge over time and we can see that um, it's changed a little bit and it looks like it's reduced um, around 2020 um, but we're still seeing sort of in the range of the 30 to 40% on average of people experiencing a delay to discharge. In the whole data set, 35% of people experienced a delay um, and it was reasonably consistent amongst people with ABI, stroke and neurological conditions and higher for people with spinal cord injury. The reasons for these delays included, these are the most common reasons for delay. So this included NDIS planning related issues, sourcing a suitable discharge destination, arranging supports on discharge and carer recruitment and training, um, as well as including NDIS eligibility issues and guardianship issues. For, uh, for people who experienced a delay to discharge, we were able to 
capture the median amount of time that they spent in hospital unnecessarily. So how many days between the day they were ready for discharge and when they were actually discharged. So medically ready for discharge and actual discharge. So how long were they in hospital for no real good reason? Um, and we can see that it's definitely looking like it's reducing over time. Um, in 2019 and 2020, we're looking at a median of around 60 days. Um, looking at the interquartile ranges and, and the full range, we're still seeing people um, stuck in hospital for sort of months where they don't actually need to be in there. And this is another visual representation of that data where each dot represents an individual and the amount of time they spent in hospital unnecessarily. Regarding those unnecessary days spent in hospital, um, it was across the, the sort of three main disability types in this table, we can see that people with ABI had the highest, um, followed by spinal cord injury and stroke. Um, it's noteworthy though that these sample sizes aren't huge, so we have to interpret that with caution. The last lot of, I guess, data like this I'll be showing you are about specific timeframes in the NDIS and health process. So these are, these are, I guess, components of the trajectory that we consider would have an impact on delays and, and potentially discharge destinations. So the first is looking at how long it takes between the day somebody's admitted and the date that people within that health service identify that they're likely to be eligible for the NDIS. And we can see that over time that's reducing and there are certainly less extreme scores. But even in 2020, we can see that it's taking sometimes over 100 days to identify somebody as likely NDIS eligible. And this is despite the vast majority of this, um, this population going on to actually become NDIS participants. And then once they're identified as likely eligible for NDIS, we wanted to know how long is it then taking for an access request form to be submitted. So the access request form is kind of the, the application, the initial application to just even be accepted before you even determine what funding you have or anything like that. And we can certainly see um, that this has also reduced over time, um, but still sometimes taking a number of months to submit that application. Overall, if we look at date between days between admission and submission of access request forms, so almost combining these two variables, we're seeing it still sitting at roughly 49 days um, between admission and submission of this access request form. The time it's taking NDIS to determine eligibility after the form is submitted has reduced substantially in 2020. So it's sort of really just now taking a number of weeks as opposed to kind of a number of months in previous years. I'm looking at how long it takes from that date to an actual planning meeting being scheduled. Um, <clears throat> and that stayed reasonably consistent over time, but it has reduced again around 2020 with, with a couple of extreme values there, but not too many. I'll note that this, this one here is on a different scale because of the extreme scores. Um, so the days between the date of the planning meeting and the date of plan approval has actually reduced over time. Um, but again, it is still sometimes taking um, some months. And this is the point in the discharge planning process where conceptually there are NDIS variables and health variables going on. So things like sourcing equipment, sourcing housing, training, um, that kind of thing is, is potentially a part of why I guess a part of what influences this, we can't say it's necessarily one sector or the other's responsibility. Sorry, I was on the wrong slide when I said that. Um, this is the date of planning meeting and date of plan approval. What I was just talking about was the days between plan approval and a date of discharge.
So looking a bit at the data a little bit more finally, um, NDIS eligibility took the longest for participants with acquired brain injury. So it took longer for them to, to, be, um, to be approved as, as participants than the others. Um, and they often ha they had longer waiting times for plan approvals. Um, overall length of stay for all disability types has been decreasing since 2018 and less extreme values have been reported for all disability types. Um, but people with spinal cord injury recorded the highest frequencies in each category of reasons for delay to discharge. Regarding long-term discharge destination, um, this graph is a bit busy, uh, but looking at the different places that people might be discharged, colour-coded by the year of admission, um, we can see that over time, um, a, a steady percentage of people are returning to a private residence, um, but also we're seeing people going into specialist disability accommodation in recent years, as well as community group homes. Um, but we're still seeing, even in 2019 and 2020, sort of around the 5% mark of people being discharged to residential aged care. So in summary, we're seeing improvements in length of stay, delays and un unnecessary days spent in hospital, um, some improved navigation of those NDIS and health timeframes, but we're still seeing experienced people experiencing lengthy delays and going into residential aged care. So there's, there's definitely work to be done here. From the scoping review and from the data in, in this project, we've been able to put together some principles for discharge planning for people with disability and complex needs. Um, and so that's really around starting the discharge planning early and keeping it on the agenda throughout the entire hospital stay. Having expert coordination and continuity of care between wards, hospitals and community. Involving the person with disability and close others in all discussions and decisions. Initiating early assessment and application for housing, home modifications, and other necessary tangible post-discharge supports, because these can take a really long time to, to get access to and implement. Preparing people for home with education to the person, close others, and support workers, and providing ample opportunity for practice with home and community visits. And I would add for that one um, there, which, which ties into the next one on open and accessible communication, Information has to be tailored for people with um, speech and language impairment. So there needs to be aphasia-friendly resources. There needs to be aphasia-friendly education. We need to understand that, that people are often experiencing a cognitive impairment, which means that we need to be um, tailoring information so that it's accessible and potentially providing it um, in, in ways that it can be repeated, um, that there are, you know, whether it's in, in written or visual form that people can refer back to and including the people around them um, if appropriate and um, ensuring that open and accessible communication is there throughout all stages of this hospital and discharge trajectory. So there are limitations to this research. Um, one is COVID-19 happened around the same time as we started to see some of those um, NDIS and health milestones reduce in 2020 and we sort of know conceptually that people in, in 2020 there was a big drive to get people out of hospital to prepare for um, prepare for an onslaught of um, COVID-19 patients coming into the hospital um, and sort of know anecdotally from from our hospital sites that we started to see delays building again so we sort of sort of drop in delays and then building again and then now we actually have this issue again so it's going to be really interesting when if when we get more 2021 data to actually look at, at, at how this might have varied just over the last 18 months um, the nature of the way this data is collected meant that there was missing data on a number of variables so if somebody was discharged from hospital before their NDIS planning meeting, for example, then we don't have data from that point onwards in their trajectory. So some of the timeframes um, have smaller sample sizes. Um, and of course, this um, particularly this quantitative study is missing the voice of people with disability, close others and health professionals 
which can give us more information um, about what's actually going on at each of those timeframes. Luckily, this um, research was designed to include a qualitative component and we have been collecting data from people with disability, um, both others and discharge planners. We just um, don't have our full sample yet and we're going to continue collecting this quantitative data um, and also planning action research and co-designed interventions tailored for local sites based on I guess what the what the pain points are in, in those services. And um, Summer Foundation is already doing some work in this space. Um, the housing brokerage project, for example, which goes in and, and provides consultation and support to, um, to health teams to improve their capacity to um, discharge people with disability to housing that aligns with their needs and preferences. It'd be really great to incorporate something like that in, um, in this research. Thanks so much for listening. I'm hoping there'll be some questions. Um, of course, a big shout out to the co-authors who kind of set this, set this project up before I came along um, and have been really great at keeping it going um, to the Summer Foundation and to the participating hospitals as well.